Um, we were doing the heat treating on this, we were using these quench plates. A lot of times knife makers are using aluminum for quench plates. I'm not sure if aluminum or steel is better. Um, I had more steel that, I, that didn't bother me to cut up than aluminum, so that was part of why I used steel. Why I say you don't know which is better, people automatically think, oh, aluminum, it'll quench out quicker, pull the heat out quicker. All you need to do is pull the heat out quick enough, of course. The other thing is steel holds more heat than aluminum. So do I really pull out more heat or do I just pull out more heat for the first five seconds and then the aluminum, which can't hold as much heat, takes longer before it cools off, even though it transfers quicker? I don't know. It, there's, there's a toss up on that. It's not as intuitive as you would think. But I did tests, the steel plates worked. The big thing that's different with us doing quench plates than other people I've seen doing quench plates was that we left them in the bag. We want to leave them in the bag to minimize the amount of decarburization. Because you can see like on our spire points, they were bagged while they were heated up, but it still got some decarburization on the surface. We're going to grind enough off that surface that it really won't matter. It's not a problem. But I wanted to leave the blades themselves as good as we could. On the back side is a straight edge that we want to maintain straight. So we really don't have material that we want to remove there other than maybe just a little bit of honing on the final cutting edge. So I didn't want to have it getting any real decarburization. Now, we had some bags that tore open as we were cooling them off. And so some of them are going to get a little bit of decarburization where the oxygen got to it. But it's still not as much as we would have got had we taken them out of the bag and put them in the plates. And that's where, because of the time of exposure at high temperature to the oxygen, it's not just the temperature and exposure versus no exposure, it's a matter of the amount of time at temperature. And so, while I saw two people on various forums about heat treating on the internet suggest leaving it in the bag, and it was something I, I thought that you might be able to do, I hadn't seen people actually do it on a video, and so that's where we did it. I had previously tested it, and at our 1800 degrees, our test pieces after uh, we had done the tempering came up at 62 Rockwell C, so they, they got good and hard, and we'll give the results on these after we do test them. Before we heat treat, we have to wrap the part in stainless steel foil. You see I'm folding up a paper towel there into a nice long strip that runs along the seam so that any air that infiltrates the foil uh, it reacts, the oxygen reacts with the carbon in the paper before it hits the part and this helps cut down on any decarburization from air infiltration. Once the paper's in there you fold up the seam and you tamp it down. You want to get it nice and tight at least three folds then you do the same on the ends. Get the paper in there and then three rolls. And once you've done that, you have your wrapped and ready stainless steel pop tart ready to heat treat. Okay, Let's see how well this works picking these up. Okay, ready? Oh, oh, oh. Boy! 
This is a lot harder to do than I was expecting. I thought it might be. Oh, God! So I don't know if I actually mentioned that the steel that we were uh, doing the plate quench hardening with was A2 tool steel, which is a common one. People make knives and, of course, tools out of it. Um, it's kind of interesting here how you see the little bits of colors. Colors come in from things that are in the paper or from oxygen that leaked in, or a combination of both. And when we wrap these, there was one of them that had gotten torn up and got rewrapped, and it really looked ugly. And obviously it was the best sealed one. <laughs> that was the one that Austin did, and I was picking on him about it being ugly. <laughs> so, but it actually was the best sealed one. So we'll grab it, and we'll grab another one, and we'll come back here. I just heard the hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come over here to our trusty Rockwell hardness tester, which as we have lots of tools in the shop, some of our trusty tools hide in obscure little corners. This one hides next to our air compressor. And what this does, for those that don't, aren't familiar with them, is there's a diamond penetrator on here. They also have different penetrators for different hardnesses, but the only one I ever care about is the Rockwell C scale. The Rockwell C scale uses a diamond penetrator and you set a preload weight on here initially. Well, not a preload, excuse me. You set a position of zero, yeah, which has a preload. It does. There's a slight load on it. We'll see the indicator. This is really just a dial indicator in there. I don't remember if that's a direct linkage or if there's a portion where it's a different amount of movement of the squish into the steel but anyway we bring it up you bring it up approximately to the top doesn't have to be exactly at the top because then you manually set the zero there so mm -hmm. that you're starting at the same point then you apply the major test load which i forget if it's 100 or 150 kilograms it's one of those sort of uh yeah, numbers they threw out there. Just somebody had to pick a number. And it has a... That is... Uh, it did not move. That's the first time I've ever seen it not move at all. Oh, duh. Okay, I was so wrong. Sorry guys, there's a second little pointer here. Yeah, along with hiding in the corner, I don't use this every day. <laughs> to get the preload, it does take a few rotations and there's a small pointer that tells you how many times you've been around the dial. Mm. <laughs> okay, so there's a little shock absorber in here. And in fact, that was one of the things I had to rebuild when I first used this. Got it, got it uh, surplus. And there's a little shock absorber that makes sure that when it applies the weight, it applies it slowly. It's not hammering weight on it. It's just letting it down. You'll see the indicator move. And that is squishing into the metal. But you don't get the actual number until you bring it back to where it has the initial preload instead of the full weight on it. Mm. So that it's measuring it um, <clears throat> with just a touching as opposed to trying to press it. And then you read the number right here. This is Rockwell C of 63. And anything over, I don't know why I'm doing that again, because I wasn't thinking. Anything over 50 is not a bad knife. Over 60 is generally considered good. Of course, there's other tests for the metal as to whether or not it's brittle and, and comparable problems when you're doing stuff. But our first test pieces of the, uh, the sample pieces came out real nice at 60 and 62. Now the 60 on the previous one, the test part, it was one that I had hardened at 1750. And they were coming out at just a sh pretty close to 61. And the second piece that I tested, I did at 1800. We did all of these at uh, 1800. <clears throat> 